so <laughs> so good to have you here <laughs> Anil, thank you so much i'm glad i was able to make it <laughs> yeah so good so we are going to i mean after Anil is going to describe the we wait a few more minutes okay, okay it okay. is spain after all so <laughs> Okay, I didn't want to have a bad impression of Spanish people getting played. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some people is connecting now, so it's a good idea that this we will give them two minutes. Is I think um, both uh, Loris and Todd are frozen. I wonder if I am frozen. No, you are no, not. Frozen. I see you. We see you very well. Good. Just my natural state that I appear that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very few things change. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And who is our co-panelist? No, no, it's just you. You are such a star. Oh. <laughs> so oh. we want all the attention to you. <laughs> okay. I had seen on the agenda there was a, yeah, another the, CEO. Yeah. Originally there was, and uh, I think Lourdes had sent you a message uh, that there had been a change and we decided to do them as individual. Right. I mean, it's too much. When I see your CV and all the things that you have to, to yes. say, you know, Anil, it's, <laughs> so, a, you lot. Know, it's a lot. And it's such I a have lot. a lot to say. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we have a lot of, to learn. <laughs> so, we have many <laughs> companies connecting. <clears throat> all these companies are so promising, so hopefully. We will see a lot of success in Andalusia and you will come also soon to Granada. That is very beautiful. <laughs> okay, should we start, Todd, or what do you think? Because I, I, is Yeah, I think we can go ahead and start and I'll take okay. care of uh, letting people in while you go ahead. Okay. So first of all, thank you. Thank you so much, Anil, for being with us. I mean, we are going to, to start uh, with a uh, overview of Anil career Can and experience. Can you hear me or am I breaking up or going in and, in and out? No, we can hear you fine. We hear you very well. Hmm. Can you hear us? I can hear you, but on occasion, uh, the, the voice goes up and down. It's breaking. Oh. As long as you can hear me, that's... Yeah, that's, that's the important thing. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to no. say that, but okay. <laughs> no, but I will say this. <laughs> no, anyway. So uh, I'm going to say to the audience that after we will have a question and answer a Q&A. So you can raise your hands with the Zoom reactions. Uh, there is a hand in it. You know how to do it. If not, you can use the chat. You can uh, just go uh, through the mic directly and um, um, ask your question because the thing is we take advantage of this and learned uh, from Anil that is such a good uh, opportunity for all, all of us. So Anil, why don't you start telling us the, your overview of your career and experience, how you mm. started? Um, why don't you say a, a little bit about what drew up you to be an entrepreneur, so, um, your, your, your path? I mean. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I was invited here by my dear friend and uh, colleague, Todd Snowden, uh, whom I went to college with. We met in the line for registration at the university, and we were both registering for biomedical engineering, which 40 years ago was not that well known uh, or popular, uh, so it was nice to find a... Um, kindred spirit and we became good friends. Uh, my background obviously is in biomedical engineering. Went to um, undergrad in Washington, DC. I did uh, two years with the uh, civilian Navy. Uh, for some reason, they assigned me as an acoustics engineer. And if you wait for it, 
we'll come back full circle to why that could have been. Um, I started what turned out to be the first of a couple of health technology startups. And I'll say health tech instead of uh, life science. I know sometimes they get pushed together. To me, life science is atoms and molecules and health tech is bits and bytes. Um, so I've always been in the bits and bytes. And my interest uh, from um, a little bit of grad school at, in Baltimore was um, electronic healthcare systems, which again, 40 years ago was a nascent uh, up and coming technology. I became fascinated. So the first company, um, we always started with moving patients' data from inside the firewall to outside the firewall, from where it was being used by physicians to where it could be used by lots of other folks, because health data is most valuable when it is shared. So um, there have been a couple of companies. Um, uh, one failed dramatically. Slipstream was a hardware failure. Um, um, uh, one was sold to WebMD. Um, another one uh, was sold to Citrix. Um, two startups ago, I was lucky enough to be part of a um, new venture named Glimpse. You don't need all the gory medical records in the medical record system. You just need a glimpse into your health history. No, that's where it came from. Uh, Apple then uh, was looking to get into um, Apple Health, as we know, as an expanding area for the company in Cupertino. And um, after about a year of playing with us, they made an acquisition. Um, my team and I went into Cupertino, and I was lucky enough to be part of the many, many directors that ran uh, health engineering. So I ran uh, two teams. One of them is health records. Of course, that is my background. Uh, during that time, I was in Cupertino, grew up in Maryland, close to Washington, D.C., um, and my little sister, Tanya, um, had earlier been diagnosed straight into stage four metastatic breast cancer. And long story short is I'm sitting in my cubicle in Cupertino. I get the call from Johns Hopkins back east. Uh, come home. Tanya has two weeks to live. It's a very strange sort of sentence to hear. It's even stranger to say. I went to Jeff, who went to Tim. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jeff is the COO at Apple. They both were treated me really well, released my handcuffs. Ooh, I went back and we bought Tanya five more months of life. But she eventually died uh, in Johns Hopkins um, on, of all dates, 9 11 of 2017. So it's. It's a date none of us will really forget. <clears throat> um, but before she died, she made her big brother promise. I mean, this sounds like a movie scene, but it is actually happened. She made me promise that I would not retire. I was 58 at the time. I'm 63 now. I would not go to the beach and, you know, have those drinks with the little umbrella and the wedge of pineapple. She goes, none of that. Um you won't take sabbatical. You got to do whatever you can to help cancer patients. Um, so we started Citizen. And Citizen is essentially medical records um, for cancer patients. And now we've expanded into many other rare diseases. Um, and I'll just finish my long-winded in intro. So that's a couple of companies behind uh, me, uh, all in health tech. Uh, one of the companies we were able to take public on the NASDAQ, I forgot that. Uh, but here's the acoustic story. Um, I'm currently a co-founder and mostly investor. They're actual co-founders of a uh, startup called Acoustic, which is in Acoustic Ultrasound. And that's not my background, but if you think back 38 years and I'm going, oh, that's why I had to go through acoustic training to get ready to be an investor in this medical device that uses acoustic technology. That sort of brings us up to, I don't know, half a dozen startups. Um, and I'll stop there and take your, take your thoughts. You're on mute, Lardis. 
Wow, that's so amazing. And you know, you have such a purpose also, no? That is so moving. So, but uh, what do you think that, uh, presuming that e the, each of your venture did not go perfectly begin, perfectly beginning to end, how did you manage to the ups and downs your company journeys? Can you explain a little bit about these ups and downs? Because that's happened yeah. all the time. All the time. So you'll notice in my background, there have been no what we call, um, you know, these billion dollar exits, none of these unicorns. And when I was coming up, there was no notion of unicorns. If you had a startup and it was modestly successful, yay, that was like, that was, that was great. Um, so I've experienced that and not to, not to play with these words, but you know, back then, if you have a hundred million dollars or three hundred million dollar exit, that's that's a good day. Now nobody looks twice at you. Um, I don't like that because it sets the bar very high for entrepreneurs. That if you can't do a unicorn, everything else is unimportant. And I I find that's just wrong on so many levels. Uh, so your question was, how do you get through it? Uh, the answer is grit, G-R-I-T. Um, doing a startup is like chewing on glass. You've got to want to do this thing. It's not like, let me be an entrepreneur. Now, since I'm old, I tend to say horrible things about young entrepreneurs. But let me, but let me share this. Um, when I was coming up, being a nerd was not a great term of affection. Being a geek, and so some of us that were pulled towards Silicon Valley and technology, it's not because we were pulled there. It's because we didn't fit into anything else in the normal world. Fast forward 40 years, uh, doing tech, doing a startup has become a destination. It's like I can go work for Google, or I can go work for McKinsey, or I can do a startup. They seem to be spoken at the same level, but they never were. So a startup has become sort of a thing on its own. It has become industrialized. Um, that's not how I came up. So I'm not sure that everyone who goes into a startup has that desire to chew on glass. Sometimes you're a little bit lost, so you go, okay, I'm going to do a startup. I'll finish the answer to the question of what, what drives people is, um, okay, this way. Right now, I, right now I'm still in Silicon Valley, up in Napa, which is a nice area. <laughs> um, the environment here under the echo chamber that we live in, Silicon Valley, is like this. What can I do to have Mark Zuckerberg pay me a billion dollars? Not much is the answer. Take the flip side is what would I get up and do every day for the privilege of doing it, even if money wasn't a problem, uh, a, a, an issue. And so in my case, it has to be I am intellectually inter um, interested and personally mm -hmm. motivated mm -hmm. in the area that I am in. There's a problem that I must solve before my time is up. I would say that is it. I don't particularly um, resonate with interesting business models unless it's something you absolutely have to solve. And I don't think a, the next dog walking app falls into that must have category. Okay, thank you so much. So what you will say based on your experience are the two or three key factors that lead to your success. This, no? This kind of a strong mm -hmm. purpose. Um, what else do you sell? I mean, because you are going to make a world better, of course. Um. <laughs> um, yes, that's what the HBO TV show always says. We're going to make <laughs> the world better using our 64-bit, you know, dual process compiler. Uh, I don't think that. I, I don't think that's the motivation. Um, a couple of three things. Um, one is people. It's right at the top. Mm -hmm. um, technology has become a bit simpler. 
before it was 16 layer circuit boards and SQL algebra. Um, now it's um, no code or low code, you know, app development. Um, that's not a bad thing, but the tech it has to take a back seat. Um, I believe that you should think about people first, product second, and process third. And I would put them on a log scale. There's a big difference between getting the right people, which I, I feel like I've been lucky uh, to have. Um, and how I look for people is you hire for attitude and you train for aptitude. And I learned this the hard way because I used to hire for aptitude. Wow, that gal or guy is a MD, PhD in an area that might be useful to us. And they came from uh, Harvard and Johns Hopkins. Wow. Um, likelihood is that that same person is kind of a dick. Sorry for my French. Um, <laughs> they know they're smart. And so they tend to, not they, I have noticed that um, there's an opportunity for them to throw their weight around and um, that's toxic, toxic. So avoid toxic um, people. Don't go for smarts, go for people that are like you that just wanna lean in. And when the going gets tough, the smart people will eject themselves the right people with the right attitude will stay. So that's number one. Number two is pick a, um, a target market that is large enough that if you fail in your absolute path, there's still other opportunities. In healthcare, I mean, you know, nine, 10, 11 trillion uh, global top line spend, 3.2 trillion in the US. Um, if I didn't do medical records, there are probably three or four other um, destinations, other problems to be solved with this technology. So give yourself some, some um, latitude. Don't aim necessarily at a very narrow uh, problem space. And I know this is antithetical. This is the opposite of what you hear sometimes because when investors get in front of, um, when you get in front of investors, they'll go, what's the app? And I just feel like using sign language, but I won't use that finger just now. I don't think they understand that apps aren't the only thing you can shoot for. Apps are a point solution. Apps do something right out of the box for someone. I'm a very big believer in platforms. Platforms don't necess aren't necessarily usable out of the box. You have to configure them and maybe code them. What's a platform? Salesforce is a platform. Um, Pinterest is a platform. Facebook is a platform. They're not point apps. You can do a lot with them. I'm a big believer in platforms uh, because of this. When you do a point app, you're naturally, what is a platform? <laughs> really one well, yeah some of ah. the companies one of the companies in this thing is a platform heuristic is a platform you might I also see. rosario heuristic okay. is my, my company by the way excellent <laughs> so, okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> we can follow up on that we can see if it's a platform it probably is i'm glad you brought that up so <laughs> what platforms do is when you have an app and it's a finished app and it's a solution whether it's successful or not, it's probably competing head to head with a whole bunch of other companies with the same or similar app. When you have a platform, there are very few companies who think about platform technology. And so what you've done with a platform is you've, you've put folks who wanna finish the solution, you've given them your platform, which is a number of rungs on the ladder. They are now 15 rungs higher on the ladder steps and they get to finish it out. What I'm saying is you've left some money on the table. Don't be greedy. It's a big universe. It's a lot of tech opportunities. So I have found that taking the platform to a certain level and saying, this is the box we're going to live in and anything above to finish out a solution from that company and that partner and that developer those are additional small pieces 
that they can then put their mark on. Give you an example. Uh, before, in the good old days, engineers had to uh, uh, spin up spindles on, you know, um, a um, cloud service, um, a hosting service, and then um, anyway, what I'm saying is AWS has given us that. We all, if, if we're going to be using technology, AWS is the bottom. I'm just going to make this up one third. And then there's the upper third. And then there might be the middle third. I like to live above AWS, but below a solution. I like to live in that layer where you can take our tech, you can use it for this, that, and the other thing. I'll finish by saying this, that, and the other thing for us is if you have people's medical records and you've aggregated them over, let's say, the last 10 years, if not the life of the patient, what can you do? You can run analytics. So it's an analytics tool that finishes out the platform. Um, you can use health records for a patient to share like their LinkedIn profile. Hey, doc, I'm going to send you my profile. And if you care to look at it and the doctor, she sends back her analysis. Those are two very different things. Pharma can use it for protocol development of new molecules. They can see the incidence rate of a certain parameter or characteristic in the population. So those are just three examples of how Citizen, our most late, latest platform, has been used in those three. I hope I'm answering your question. Can I just follow up on that. You sent me a message the other night about a, a recent milestone with Citizen and, and the use of Citizen. And many of the companies who are on here today operate in the regular regulated environment of the FDA and the EMA. And I, I think what you sent me, I'm, I mean, one, it's incredible. And two, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting story from the point of view for those who are operating in the regulated environment yeah. around how regulatory isn't rule-based or law-based. Uh, it's about creativity and argument-based. And maybe you yeah. could, I don't know how, whether this is public, what you sent me or whatever, but if you could talk to that a bit, that would be great. Public? Nothing's public. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> um, Todd is talking about a, a little milestone that our company had, Citizen. So we know in the regulatory space, FDA, GDPR, whatever they call it in China and India, um, health technology like this is highly regulated, whether it's uh, zeros and ones or whether it's atoms and molecules, highly regulated. Um, there's a loophole in that. While covered entities, a technical term, a legal term in the U.S., covered entities are, um, are um, covered under HIPAA. We can forget what the rule is, but it's a very tight privacy and security and use of you know, data and all of that. So people are very um, cognizant. They are very aware that they're, that they're dealing with really sensitive data when they're inside the covered entity. Um, that's researchers. Uh, physicians, insurance companies, epidemiologists. Hey, I said that right. You know who's not there is the patient. The patient is not under HIPAA, and people sort of forget that. And what that gives us is if we work directly with the patient, the citizen, and they ask for their records from anywhere, they can't be refused. Others, those other four can be refused. You have to contract and we'll share our data. How much will you pay us? not the patient. So we use the patient as a wormhole through the regulatory space. And the point of it is that I don't know what they call the, the HIPAA laws in China or India, but I know most places in the world allow the patient to have a copy of their data. And that was one of the key points that allowed us to move quickly uh, from data collection. What we did and what Todd is talking about is um, the FDA here in this example has never accepted patient supplied data in their IND, um, investigational new drug filing, you know, a truckload of information. It's always been clinical and biochemical and experimental. Um, about two weeks ago, we worked, we were working with a uh, rare disease company 
We started two years ago with them. And um, two weeks ago, they submitted their IND to the FDA. That's usually five, six, seven years. We took from hello, how do you do, to submission in two years. Um, because we didn't have this regulatory framework that we had to sort of push through. The most important part of that is the FDA has never, ever accepted um, patient supply data, at least for rare diseases, a growing category. Not only did they accept that the citizens' patient supply data, it was the only data that was required for the IND. There was no other experimental data. It was all observational. It was rich enough to convince the, to make an argument with the FDA that, look, we did this and that's what happened. And we think that's a milestone because the FDA has never done patient supplied and exclusively. So it's, it's, it's a little dent in the universe as Steve Jobs would say, um, but hopefully people will sort of pry that dent open and use patient data more and more. Um, so that's what Todd was talking about. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> so inspiring. I work with a good team. Yeah, that's so good. The team that you, you mentioned that way, how do you balance building the team when burn rate? When you have a burn rate? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, please. How do you balance building the team with burn? Oh, burn, burn rate. Burn, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, burn rate, right. <laughs> burn. It, very important. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've read some books and some mythology that if you find great people, um, they're sometimes 10x better than other alternatives, sometimes 100x better. And I've been lucky, I don't know how, but I've been lucky um, to have these conversations and, and recognize this person would kill for the opportunity to work on this problem. You find those people, and instead of needing 50 engineers, you can usually get away with 12 to 15, especially given the, the, the tools that we have, the low code, and uh, especially given the prototypes that we can build that are very high fidelity, very quickly, because we don't have to build them in assembler in C++ anymore. Um, so you find the right people, your burn rate can be low. Um, and one more thing, uh, tranche the, the process out. You know, being in a startup is, is not a big bang. Every day you go in and every day you get the beat, you know, the crap beaten out of you. And every day you have to go and go, you don't have to go, what did I get done? It's like, I survived. Yes. Survival is the threshold <laughs> that I have looked yeah, for. Of course, of course. Tomorrow, it's a new day. Today, let's have a glass of wine. Uh, now Good. that could be at the end of a 10 hour day or a 12 hour day, but you leave that weight behind you. If you do that personally, I think that a small team um, using finite resources, which is all I've ever had, can do amazing things, especially in healthcare, especially in health tech, because the investors and their limited partners and VCs, they don't really know a lot about health tech. And so anything that you can bring to the table, you don't have to over impress them which is expensive burn, lots of people. Um, so grow slowly. Only add folks when everyone else in the team is running at 120% of capacity. Then you're authorized to add a person. Okay. okay Keep your so burn down. Keep your burn down. Yeah. Good. And when you're hiring... For a startup, what are these key attributes? You say a little bit, but you look for outside of the specific skill you are hiring for. This motivation, this special. You say great people. You're, I have a great team, but how you, how do you know that? What are the determinants of success of hiring hmm. to a startup? Well, there's the initial hiring when you don't know the person, and so yes. you've got to have some 
<clears throat> metrics. And then there's what you find out let's say a few months later. It doesn't take longer than that to know whether you've got a good hire. Um, I've stolen the following that I'm going to say from a VC that I've quoted, uh, but what I look for is heart, smarts, guts, and luck. So if you think about it, this kind of sort of covers lots of areas. Obviously the heart is, I gotta work on this. Oh my God, I couldn't sleep at night. You know. Uh, smart says um, that is obvious. They have to have some background that allows them to bring a new perspective or supporting perspective or line of thought to the problem at hand. We can define smarts in many different ways. Then the guts. <clears throat> Lots of folks think they want to be in a startup because it's whatever you want to call that. Um, no, I'm not unemployed. I'm in a startup. And of course, that's meant to be a little bit rough, but I see it a lot in Silicon Valley. They don't know what they're in for the startup. Uh, I think it's very different overseas uh, in Europe. Very it's very different. different in Spain, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I am um, a uh, advisor to a small uh, venture fund in Barcelona, uh, mm -hmm. Nina Capital. Yeah, and, I know. We know that too. Oh, Yes. <laughs> the quality of the startups, the ventures that they are vetting, it's it's 10x compared to what I see here. So you guys are doing well. So heart, smart, guts. Um, can you do this? When the going gets tough, will you look for the exit stage right? Um, I don't know how to how to put that into words, but I always try to find is there something that the person did in their past that shows their ability to lean into the hurricane and get through it as opposed to throw in the towel and go, whew, that was hard. And then the last one is luck. This one's a tricky one because if you have the first three, but you align yourself with a person that is perpetually unlucky, I'm sorry, but that doesn't work. When you have a small team, you need everyone um, to bring some sprinkle dust, something magic. Um, and I'll give an example. I once hired a very smart fellow, um, PhD, machine learning professor. And it only occurred to me after a year when he left that you know I should have figured out that this fellow is driving the same shipbox car that he was driving 15 years ago as a grad student. And I'm not sure that's a indication of luck, but it's someone that hasn't moved through their, you know, opportunities. They're sort of stuck. Um, there are quite a few examples of, um, of folks that just, wherever they go, good people surround them. So those are kind of the four things. When you know you've, let's say after three months, when you, when you have seen that person succeed or not, um, here's the metric. <clears throat> there are two kinds of sort of business or tech people. There's employees and then there's the uh, owners. And you can't make one into the other. And after a couple of months, their true temperament might emerge. And you can see, are they here? Not necessarily just to punch the clock and collect a check, but they're an employee. They look up to you for risk management versus an owner. You know, we can, we can all, that person comes to you and goes, I'm going to do this. Fire me if you don't like it. And I've had two people like that in, in Citizen. Um, one of them, she was going to leave. And she came to me and said, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nobody thinks we should do this. We both talked about it. We both took a risk on it. Um, she's now a freaking superstar. She's a pain in the ass. Boy, is she a superstar. Um, you know, she'll do 10 million top line this year in rare diseases. You know, she's got a couple of contracts. One is 5 million over three years. One is 2 million. Oh, my God. That's real money. Um, so she's an owner. That's how you tell. Wow.
So um, in your experience, how do you invest your perspective building the team? More from a control the burn perspective or more from having all the resources you need to success as rapidly as possible? I missed the first part of that. So in your experience, how do investors perceive building the team? More from a control, the burn, is that war again, burn, burn perspective? Or more having all the resources you need to success as rapidly as possible? Ah, uh, uh, very definitely the first. The first. I know that we, I know that we think having the money is the solution, but I can tell you from experience, it's exactly opposite the solution. If you have all the money that you need and you can hire all the people, I guarantee you're going to fail. I mean, I can't guarantee it, but in, in my estimation, uh, <clears throat> you know, you go out and you play pretend successful startup. You have your rubber plants and your Arion chairs and, you know, your six kinds of bottled water and four kinds of oatmeal in the morning and all of that stuff. Kits of death. You want a small team that is building a prototype that is testing their hypothesis and figuring out, okay, if we had more money, we would just get this big supercomputer. And if we, I'm, I'm making a bullshit from, you know, like cray years from 40 years ago. Um, but if we didn't have all the money, we have to get much more creative. And we have to ask ourselves, is this what we should be doing? Or is there something less? And having less money I'll ask, allows you to ask the following question. Um, what business are we in? What is the minimum we can do, not the maximum we can do? Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of platforms, let's do this. I'm constantly downloading snapshots of screens. Oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And I want to add them in. But I suppose I'm old enough and smart enough not to do that. The solution is, what can I do to make that company with that solution that I'm really admiring? What can I do? to help put money into their bank account? How can we API in? How can I give them data that then allows their incredibly nice interface, for example, to be part of the ecosystem? Okay, so co coming from raising capital, what in your experience are the two or three more important factors to your success in raising capital for your companies? Team? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll give three short answers. One okay. is um, having done this a few years, um, it's a bit easier. The older you get and the more modestly mm -hmm. successful and you know, you're known in the community, get yourself out there and be a leader of thought. Costs you nothing. Um, then when the VCs and other investors go, hey, I'm looking at this uh, deal, Oh, yeah, I ran into him at a dinner, uh, you know, two weeks ago. Yeah, that's that, That's a really good, you know, blah, blah, blah. So get yourself out there. Uh, don't sit in the engineering lab. Number two is um, storytelling. That might mm -hmm. be the most important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were trading emails and uh, you said uh, you can pontificate. And boy, I said, do you know me really well? <laughs> you know. I'm I sorry like about that. In Spanish, no. it's a little different. You know? No, no, no. It's the exact <laughs> word to describe me. I'm like this a lot of times. I like to tell the story. And the story has to start from someplace the investor understands. So if I tell a story about electronic medical records and machine learning and AI, someplace along that continuum, I'm going to lose them. The, the tech is overpowering. But if I catch them at the problem space, so I'll go, you know, you and I are patients. We go in and remember, you know, I was someplace and I had a nightmare and they couldn't find my records and nobody would fax them over. Have you ever had an experience like that? And then they're building your story for you. So start someplace with anybody where they can jump in, cut you off and complete your thought. That's the hook. Now you have said it. So that's number two. 
And number three is <clears throat> don't be greedy. Leave money on the table. Um, an example is um, Citizen. So Citizen Kane, this is the most recent one. Citizen was acquired by Invite last year, uh, who's a um, genomic testing company. We thought genomic data, genome data, wow, what a combination. Um, it would have been if Invite stock hadn't tanked 92%, but that's a whole different story, a whole different story. Um, lost my trend of thought. Um, third thing, leave money on the table. <clears throat> Um, and Dreesen Horowitz. Now, I've only met Mark and Dreesen once, uh, twice. Um, we pitched to him. I've never sweated so much. He's a real piece of work. So anyway, um, you go in, talk to the partner, tell them what you're doing. <clears throat> I had two term sheets in my back pocket. I told them I had two term sheets in my back pocket. And I actually did. Don't lie. They will call your bluff. Um and the partner said, well, I can give you a term sheet right now. They're all non-binding, so big deal. I go home for hours later, there's a term sheet. Um, I'll just tell you some of the numbers. Uh, the first two term sheets were 28 million valuation post and 30 million. Um, the Andreessen Horowitz term sheet was 20 million post. Well, that's a big difference, but it's Andreessen Horowitz. So I went with them. Don't be greedy. Think long term. Don't sh think small arc. Think long arc. You're the CEO. You don't have the luxury of thinking small arc. You got to see past the, I think I'm getting screwed on this, whatever it is. But ultimately, that's okay. I'll lose a little money here and I'll make it there. Uh, so that's a third thing. Don't be greedy. Leave money on so the good. table. So, so good. In your bio, you say you're self-funded, one of your companies. How did you decide when to self-fund and when to pursue, pursue funding? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm in a hotel room. It's a little early here in Napa Valley. My wife is sleeping over there. So she was in on the decision. Todd knows her extremely well. Um, Glimpse was all self-funded, the company that sold to Apple. And in the beginning, you start, now five years ago, medical records was not a hot topic. So we said, we'll just self-fund. We had a little capital from some of the previous exits. Um, and then why did we continue? Because no one would fund us. I'm a good storyteller, but no one would fund us. And so the, the short arc of that is... Um, we were 20 weeks away from personal bankruptcy. I don't usually tell that story. And I remember my lawyer, um, an attorney, and uh, we were negotiating with Apple. And number two at Apple, Jeff, sent us a term sheet. And, I go, and we were going to run out of money, personal bankruptcy. But it was unfair to the team. It was very fair to me. Unfair to the team. So I sent it back said, no, thank you. He calls me, you know, next morning. What, what do you mean? No, thank you. Nobody says no to Apple. Um, <clears throat> so I relayed that story to our attorney. He goes, man, you got big. You know what he said? Uh, 20 weeks from, from bankruptcy. Um, you gotta want to do this. Now I may be an extreme example of putting risk above everything else. But if you truly believe in it, it's not a risk. You will be successful. That's so good. <laughs> I mean, thank you so much for sharing this. So uh, you have raised capital both from venture capitals and corporates. What are the differences, if any, between raising from the two? Uh, one is valuation sensitive and one is not. Okay. Obviously, the VCs are valuation sensitive. They um, they want as much as they can get on every round because their exit is monetary. Um, strategics have another purpose. So we partner with Praxis, the biotech company, two years ago, blah, 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 FDA. <clears throat> they put some money in. They gave us a great contract, $5 million. It's non-dilutive. Wow. 
that's even better. Um, it's strategic. So we all are pulling the same direction. Whereas VCs are occasionally trying to architect the company instead of letting it organically go where it should. They're cutting deals. They're introducing us to strategic to strategic people. It is um, the mechanics of building a venture, but not building the venture. Um, I'll stop there. And maybe we can take some questions. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, the audience can raise your hands or you can take the mic and ask questions. Well, maybe if you raise your hands, it's a little bit in more order, just so it will be better. Uh, so do you know how to do that? Raise your hands from the Zoom. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. We see here as a chung go ahead. Yeah, hey, Anil. Thanks a lot for sharing your, your thoughts. It's been amazing. Uh, we don't normally have like these kind of experiences like um i i would like to to ask you a, a couple of questions if i might sure. so yeah um first uh, i really like what uh you guys are, are doing with the medical records because of course uh most of the health entities think that the medical records they they owe them they owe them they are like mm -hmm. the treasure and mm -hmm. that's not actually true because they belong to the patients so it's kind of uh, it's kind of the same. Um, so um, I also have my, my personal experience. You have that uh, you you experience the same. I, I also had the same with my grandpa. With a nurse almost killed my grandpa by making mm -hmm. an identification error, mm -hmm. and that's why we are creating like a kind of software to identify patients with fingerprints. So maybe we can have like father talks in oh, the future wow. if Lourdes allows us. But <laughs> yeah, so. Um, I, I, I would like to ask if you previously see like some successes of uh, European startups uh, going to the US because uh, what uh, I've been experiencing in the last month is I'm also like in talks with investors from Boston mm -hmm. um, which, are, which are like really, really amazing. Of course, we would like to have Sequoia, Mark Cuban and those kind of investors. Like As you said, I, I don't... I don't, um, I prefer like giving them more, more equity, but having those names uh, in, my, in my portfolio, of course, but to reach to those levels, you need to have a certain kind of yeah. uh, device or maturity. And in order to be in that space, you need to rise your first round. So I'm trying to, or we are trying to enter the US market. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe you have some thoughts about how the, the European companies uh, should enter the, the US market or which, or maybe I, I can uh, change my question. Uh, how the European uh, companies, we need to change our mentality to convince US investors to invest on us? Complicated, uh, certainly. Um, let me give that some thought. two or three things one is <clears throat> partner with people it's a lot easier to have a local representation um, in the beginning when you're entering the u.s try to figure out what it what is it that's a win for you is it market presence so you've got a foothold you, you didn't make any money but you're there you've landed or is it revenue generating or is it for investor credibility? I would say um, leave the money out of it just for a moment. And um, which is always, you know, whenever you're making a decision, leave the money out of it, make your decision, put the money back in and see how you feel about your decision. You might tell yourself eh, two out of three. Um, so if you're going to talk with investors, I would say have someone local, um, um, uh, represent you, whether it's a um, investor that's um, European, US, and there's quite a few of them, um, try to have an introduction to an American investor, an American team. Um, there are enough FDA difficulties that are different from Europe and other countries that you want someone to speak the same language and you want to be aligned with them. 
Your success is their success and vice versa. Don't try to go it alone necessarily, unless there's some special condition that allows you to do that. Partner. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Marcin, do you want to continue with your question? Yes. Um, I, I wonder if, you, because you talked more about um, uh, clearance with FDA, the, an example of collecting medical records from, from patients uh, looks for me very exciting. Um, the, my specific question would be, uh, do, do you know or do you have experiences with uh, European um, approval, uh, we, which would be CE marking or because this is medical device what I work with. Specifically, these are there would be CT uh, images of patients mm -hmm. and their history to, to contact myself with some patients association and gets this way hundreds of probably I mean, if they will images for 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 for, for testing or training. Oh, <clears throat> you're looking. It, it, is is your question where might one go to have a, uh, a cohort of test images? whether it's in Europe or in, in US, so you can run training on your algorithms? Is that the question? I don't understand your question now very much. Oh, well, he's that makes trying to, He's trying to repeat your question to understand if is that was the, your question. So could you repeat? Um, and you say uh, that yeah. again, sorry. I am lost. I don't know whose question we are repeating. Now, Anil, let me let me repeat. Right, to, let it be two questions. General, if you have any experience with that methods of I don't know using uh, patients' records for approval of devices in Europe, <clears throat> yeah. whichever is C marking, MA yeah. or whatever is that. Sure. And the second specific, more specific, is is it? Do you think it will work? case America or US or Europe, if I contact, for example, the uh, association of patients and ask them, okay, you guys had a family, family person who had some, some problems, some hemorrhages, and would you mind sharing mm -hmm. the, the data? I understand. Th this would be accepted, say, in Europe. Yeah, like that. yeah. No, I understand. Uh, let's attack the first problem first. Um, we have the same sorts of problems. Um, people talk about data, but they really mean a document. It's a fax, it's an image, it's a JPEG, it's an XML, it's a PDF, it's a Word. Documents aren't data any more than crude oil is 93 octane. It needs to go through a processing refinery, a, a ETL process, extraction yeah. transform. Um, so we have a similar problem. We this is what we did. Let's say we, we got um, a thousand documents from various patients. We'll take 500 and set them aside as a, a reference, a gold, gold standard, and we'll have manual extraction from these 500 um, records. That's as good as it can get, human manual extraction. <clears throat> we'll then take the other 500, obviously. This is not news to you. You, you know this. And we'll tune our algorithms to try to get to the point where there's an acceptable automation threshold that we have reached. Like for male and female characteristics, you know, when you pick up a male and female piece of data, we can get to 99% credibility. If you're going to pick up ECOG scores for and biomarkers and histological subtypes, those run about 60% that the machine can match the human. What you're talking about <clears throat> is the value of the training set. And I would encourage you to use any kind of data, including patient supplied data, which you asked about. I think it's fine to use patient supplied data because in the beginning, you need to prime the pump with some sort of information. And you're not so worried about meeting a threshold because you're just getting started. That threshold stuff is optimization, putting in different data sets. Um, so I think the answer to your question is yes, you can use um, patient supplied. 
for machine learning. We have. Um, your your second question was something I should think about. I know a number of folks, not a lot, but I know a number of folks, and you're free to reach out to me by email. Um, and maybe I can connect you with some folks in, um, in uh, you know, have a big cache of DICOM images if, if that's useful to you. I, I, my... I think I will ask for your email. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good. And in... Thanks a lot. Gabriela from ATG, do you have a question also? Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for sharing your experience where, with us. Um, so according with your experience, when is the right time to professionalize the team? Um, if you can uh, say mm -hmm. more or less about that, and mm -hmm. what could be a reasonable compensation, for example, after Series A? Ah, good questions both. Okay, let's, um, let's separate them. To to, um, you know, startups make products and companies make money. And so there's going to be a shift between when the temperament of the company is not startup anymore. We need process. We've gotten to the point where if we don't have process, we've got great people doing great things and we have great product and now we need some process. You will know when that process when you've tripped over it, that's the time to add what I'm going to call middle management. And that's not to be you know, pejorative term. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean about it. In the beginning, you have people who point the solution, some of the leaders, and you have people who do the work. You don't have a lot of process. You don't have a lot of management. You don't have marketing. You're marketing. Um, founders always, I mean, founder-led teams always get better credibility with investors. So I would say that probably, ballparky, probably two years. If you can go two years without having management, people who manage people just for the purpose of managing them as, as opposed to building product or something technical or business, um, I think that's about right. Don't hire middle management until you absolutely need it. Compensation in Europe and different parts of the, even in the US, it's very different. It's very competitive here in the US. Um, we all know of kids who come out of Stanford and um, they're big shots. They've always been told they're big shots and they want a quarter million dollars for their first job out of school. They want 10%, maybe more of the company they want a senior position, probably a C-suite or CTO. Um, so I'm not sure I'm a great judge because I live in a very effed up environment in Silicon Valley. Um, but you know what? Once again, if you want to reach out and you've got a, like a specific, this is the candidate, how much might he or she you know, command in the U.S. and then we can do some sort of discount. I'm, I'm happy to have that quick email conversation with you. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay. Can I, I will follow reach up you. on one thing you said there, yeah. Anil, um, about the two years? So you're speaking about that from a um, uh, basically health tech or health IT perspective, uh, not necessarily, just so everybody's clear here, not necessarily talking about a... Um, you know, a, a pharma development project. Where oh, yes. You're, you're, uh, and, I, and you have a little bit of experience with the reality of pharma development yourself. So um, just so people aren't taking that two years and applying it um, blanketly yes. to all different types of companies. So. Yes, of course. yes. The answers to all my questions tend to lean towards zeros and ones and not atoms of molecules. Biotech, wet bench chemistry, exactly what Todd said. Those lead times are crazy. Unless you can use patient supply data to accelerate. <laughs> That's two years, a great two years. idea. <laughs> uh, um, Todd, you were saying something that 
um, two years. Okay. Um, another point. When you're doing a startup, how do you know when to throw in the towel? How do you know when it's just not going to happen? Um, my, my rule of thumb in tech is three years. If three years you haven't raised a little money, built an MVP, got some good people, and started to get product market fit, if you take more money, all you're doing is extending the runway. If you haven't figured it out in three years and start to have some revenue, it is very tough to then go raise money and raise money because the investor is going to go, let's see, you've been doing this five years and you're where? <laughs> no, if, if this was a real thing and you guys could do it, you would have done it in the first two or three years. I have seen that. I tend to think like that. This is one man's opinion. So don't throw good money after bad. If it's really not sticking after three years, re reassess. But again, that time frame is probably different. Very much. Yes. Tech yeah. to obviously pharma, but the concept, uh, I absolutely agree. If that yeah. Was it could be five or six years in the world, Todd, that, you know, you live in or, or, or longer. Um, so yes, it's it's exclusive to tech. What I'm talking about that that's really my only experience. Okay, thank you so much, Anil. And if you could one only give one piece of advice to a startup CEOs, what will it be? One piece of advice. Ooh. Wow, you can't ask that to a person who likes to talk. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> it is not about money it is not about resources mm. it's just if I was to give one piece of advice I would say this when you're young uh, there are a lot of impediments in your way regulatory the doctor the risk manager at the hospital who will or won't give you a contract it'll take 10 months to get the red lines worked back and forth I tend to tell folks, try to do activities where you're in control of a success or failure. Don't put third parties between as a gating function between you and the other side, which is success. So that's why we use, uh, not use, that's why we partner with patients. Nobody can stop a patient and therefore nobody can stop us. Um, when we do technology, we try to use open source. Nobody can prevent us. When we are partnering, um, anyway, I could go on, but the point is try to have all your activities as much as possible within the control of your team or your partners. So you're not just sitting there waiting for someone else to get back to you and burning cash. Make progress every day. Bring it home. Even if you have to give up lots of parts of the externalized you know, expansion of a platform, if you can just bring it down to, we absolutely know we can do this. You guys in? Six weeks? Pizza? Beer? <laughs> That's the, it's momentum. It is not resources and capital that makes a company go. It is hope and momentum. Everything else is secondary. That's so good. I love that. So thank you so much. I don't know if there is any other question. I mean, in the audience, Todd, do you want to say something? Nope. <laughs> Just thank you very much for your time, Anil. It was uh, very interesting was, and was, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully helpful to the uh, attendees today. And I'm, I'm confident that-, that Good. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so I much for your time. It. Hi. Good luck bye to bye all bye. of you. you Fingers crossed. Bye. Bye. bye.